the principal will come but anyway keep it ready uh, just a live stream is visible from my account can anyone else check if it's working live stream is visible from my account can anyone else check if it's working live stream is Yeah, yes, it's visible. Oh, Hello Sumit uh, welcome to the event 
glad to see you hello sumit yes. very nice to uh, have you here we are just uh, we we just uh, start in one or two minutes sumit i think your audio is muted okay am i audible now yes very much yeah thank you Good afternoon, everybody. We will be starting shortly. We're just waiting for a few more people to join. I think we can pick it now. Yeah. Yeah. Let's. Kavya, I think your audio is muted. Oh, 
Um, good afternoon to everyone present. Um, on behalf of the Viraki Editorial Board, I would like to welcome you all to the release of the latest edition of the annual magazine of the Department of Sociology, Jesus and Mary College. Before we begin, I would like to give out a few instructions to ensure the smooth conduct of the event. Kindly turn off your microphone for the entire duration of the program to avoid any disturbances during the lecture and the release. The speaker for the day will engage with the audience in a Q&A round after the lecture. Participants are requested to post their questions in the chat box for the same. The moderators for the event will ask the speaker the questions on behalf of the participants. Thank you. Miraki, the annual magazine of the Department of Sociology, has been an ongoing tradition since 2015. From the very beginning, the magazine has focused on creating a space for the different and untold experiences. While last year's edition focused on the visualization of dissent, this year we look at the various social consequences of the pandemic. Ever since the infamous virus invaded our society, we have all experienced a shift in the spatial and temporal dimensions of our lives. The very idea of space has taken on different meanings for everyone. As the world shuts down right in front of us, most familiar spaces fall out of our reach. For most of us, one of those familiar spaces was our college campus. The campus space is a sphere of a multitude of activities that make up the very ethos of what we believe to be the quintessence of college life. This edition of Meraki attempts to unscramble what campus space meant to different sets of people and in what means to them now, given the shift in space from physical classrooms to online meets. Since this experience has been different for everyone, we felt it would be appropriate to find out firsthand how the lives of people changed and how they coped with the difficulties brought on by the virus. For this purpose, we introduced to you the newest section of our magazine dedicated to the experiences of different groups of people who make up the campus space. Tanya Yadav, Saina Mishra, Anit Bindra, and Kavya Jacob spoke to teachers, college freshers, wage workers, and several anti-caste activists and student leaders across colleges in Delhi in order to gain a clearer understanding of ground realities. We navigate through conceptual and imaginative perspectives of what space means to all of us and what influence campus politics has on everyday life in college and how all of it has changed in the present scenario. We also try to understand what it's been like to shift our lives to the online mode and how the wage workers working on our campus every single day have dealt with it. We hope that this project of ours brings the different realities of life attached to the campus space to light. Campus spaces and campus politics are closely linked. As someone who has been a part of youth-led movements on reshaping campus spaces, Sumit Samos can give us a deeper understanding of politics and realities of campus space. Sumit Samos is an anti-caste rapper and activist who believes in expressing the harsh realities of our society through the artful craft of prop culture rap. He completed his studies from JNU. During his tenure, he was closely associated with BAPSA, Birsa Ambedkar Phule Students Association, an association which raised awareness against the atrocities faced by the Dalit community. Being from the Dalit community himself, he reflects the discrimination and stereotypes surrounding the community. His first rap video Yo, Ikle is a call for revolution by the people who faced Savarna oppression. Based on the ideals of Ambedkar and Fule, his other pieces are also a work of art, perfectly blending politics and sentiment. His work, his works consistently, he works consistently, keeping his symphony related to the present times. It is an honor to have you, sir. We are sure that all of us would learn a lot from you today. to invite sir to release the annual magazine Meraki. Thank you. <coughs> Am I audible? Yes, you are. 
Yeah, thank you so much for the invitation. I don't know how to proceed now. Uh, should I should, should I be speaking or like uh, you're launching the magazine in the beginning itself? Sumit, maybe you can show a screenshot of the magazine and then you can start your lecture. Okay, yeah, just a second. Just, just, just a second. Or do you want us to do it? Yeah, if you could do it. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Abhya, can you just show the uh, screenshot? Is my screen visible? Is my screen visible to everyone? Yes, Agha. Yes, it is. Visible, Agha. Uh, the cover. Just, uh, I think you'll have to shift it a bit. Yeah, it's fine. Perfect. This is the magazine for this year and uh, we've emailed a copy to everybody who's registered. We hope you enjoy going through it. So I think you can um, begin your lecture for us, please. Yeah. <coughs> yes. Uh, thank you so much uh, to the Merake team and JMC for inviting me to speak on this topic. Um, well, I, I read some of the articles already. Two, three art I think two, three articles I already read about gender and caste and about navigating personal relationships during COVID pandemic times. And you know it's it's a real initiative. Um, I'm really glad to be part of this discussion. Um, well, uh, to start with, uh, stu Ambedkar student activism. Um, I'll divide it into two parts. One, I'll talk about student activism in general, st the history of student activism. Uh, then I'll move on to uh, how Ambedkar student activism emerged in the con you know in, in the contemporary times and how is it going now, right? So if I were to talk about student activism, um, you know, there are two kinds of student activism that that exists, at least in Indian student campuses. One is organized student politics, uh, organized student activism, and another is individual students doing it. And uh, organized student politics and individuals, individual students doing activism, it goes back to the times of, you know, Indian freedom movement, 1940s, 1930s. Uh, not just in India, you see students meeting even abroad, in, even in UK when people, you know, students were studying there, they used to meet, right? So, and um, at that point of time, uh, around 1930s, uh, post 1940s, I guess, you have All India Student Federation, which is a student wing of Communist Party of India. You have uh, later ABVP, Akhil Bharatiya Vidyarthi Parishad coming up around 1950s. Um, then later in 1960s, 70s, you have SFI, Student Federation of India. Uh, that's a student doing of uh, Communist Party of India, Marxist. And then NSY, like National Students Union of India, that's a student doing of Congress. And all of these organized student uh, groups have been active for a very long time now. You know, prior to 1970s, they have been active, uh, many of them, like uh, especially ABVP and uh, AISF. Right, and they have been part. They have been active in different different political movements, events in this country. Uh, and three events that comes to my mind is uh, first is of course Indian independence movement. Then second is um, <laughs> Sorry for that. It will continue, Sumit. Yeah. <laughs> okay. 
I did, I did. I removed him three times. One can the participant be blocked? Uh, I will, if I find him again, I'll, I removed him. Next time I'll block him. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, should I start? Yes. Yes. Yes, please block him, please. Yeah, I did, but it's uh, I don't know why, why is it coming again. Sumit, continue. Yeah. Okay. Yes, so there are four different groups, there are four different student groups that I was talking about. One is AISF, another is SFI, uh, and then NSY and ABVP. They have been active prior to 1980s, and they have been part of various political events in this country. And uh, between 1970 to 1990, you have two, diff two big political events in this country. One is the emergency during Indira Gandhi times, and the other one is Mandal Commission in 1990, right? And... Um, and many leaders have come out of student activism. If you see Delhi University, you have people like Arun Jaitley. Uh, if, you know, uh, people like Arun Jaitley. In JNU, you have Prakash Karat, Sitara Mechuri, Kavita Krishnan. All of them have come from student activism. Uh, even Amit Shah has come out of ABVP at a point of time. So big political leaders, if you see today, um, many of them have come out of student activism during 1970s, 80s. Uh, this entire strand of uh, you know the socialist tradition, uh, the Janta Party, uh, people like Lalu Prasad Yadav, people like Ram Bilas Paswan, they have also come out of student activism around 1990s. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, uh, in all of this, uh, you see an absence of Ambedkarite student activism. You no, know? Ambedkarite student groups emerging. Um, for the, uh, I mean, after Ambedkar dies, after Ambedkar dies, you know, uh, the Republican Party of India is one of the party which is led by Dalit leaders. Then around 1970, you have Dalit Panthers party, you know, Dalit Panthers movement in Maharashtra. Then post 1980, you have Bhajan Samaj party in Uttar Pradesh. And students have been part of them as cadres, but um, there was no, you know, separate student organization based on the idols of Ambedkar, based on, uh, you know, based on, um, based on idols of Ambedkar, based on, uh, they, based on the idea of organizing the Dalit people, based on the idea of uh, creating a space for themselves. Um, and uh, none of this, be it Dalit Panthers movement or be it Bahujan Samaj Party or even VCK in Tamil Nadu, none of them paid so much of emphasis on, uh, you know, uh, forming a student's wing. And, w and when you study this, I think one of the major reasons is that um, because even these groups, even this larger political parties having Dalit base, uh, even they did not have enough resources or organizational structures to begin with. And so to have a Dalit student wing among them, I think it was very difficult at that point of time. But if I were to talk about campus politics, um, campus politics, be you know, I, um, if, I talk, if I talk about big, big campuses, you know, like Hyderabad Central University, Delhi University, JNU, or um, uh, Osmania University, in all of this, Dalit students have been doing activism, um, lower caste students have been doing activism, but they have been doing activism under left groups or, you know, under NSY, you know, uh, under different groups, but they have not been able to organize themselves for a very long time, right? And uh, there are four reasons for that, if, you know, if, if I were to look at it, the four reasons. One is, of course, you don't have enough resources. Another is you don't have patronage. When I say patronage, of course, you know, there has to be some political party or a group of professors or some external support, which none of the Dalit students or low caste students had. Uh, so you don't have you don't have resources, you don't have patronage and you don't have protection. No, you don't have protection to do student politics. You also need some amount of protection from somewhere. And I think none of that Dalit students had. And um, and if if you look at all India Survey of Higher Education till a point of time, um, 
the presence of Dalit students in Central University campus spaces was very less. Uh, was very less and low caste students, the OBC students started coming into uh, university campus space post 2007 when Mandal Commission was implemented, right? So this shows that Ambedkar student activism or uh, what we call Dalit Bodhan student activism took a very long time to emerge uh, from campus spaces. At least, uh, you know, if I talk about big campus spaces like JNU, H, JNU, Osmania University, J, um, HCU, um, so on and so forth. However, if I were to, to talk about the beginning of Ambedkar student activism, it goes back to um, 19, uh, mid 1980s, right? And it starts from Andhra Pradesh. In Andhra Pradesh, there was a Dalit, there was a massacre of Dalits in Karam Chedu, 1985. And uh, that gave birth to an uh, organization called Dalit Mahasabha. And Dalit Mahasabha, uh, it was, uh, it started as a support system for the victims. Uh, but later it, you know, it later it gradually turned into a group. Uh, later it gradually turned into literary movement. You know, people started writing, people started writing poetry, people started writing uh, sh short stories in Telugu. And that was kind of, you know, that was the kind of, that was beginning of some kind of Dalit consciousness in Andhra Pradesh and in Telangana, uh, that Dalit massacre that happened. And around that time, 1990s, you also see Mandal Commission coming out, you know. So students across Indian campuses were almost divided into two groups, one supporting the OBC reservation, the other not supporting the OBC reservation. And so this, so these two events at that point of time led to um, formation of Ambedkar Students Association in Hyderabad Central University. I think Ambedkar Student Association in Hyderabad Central University was the first Ambedkar openly proclaiming Ambedkar student organization, at least in campus politics. And, um, and that also coincided with the fact that it was the beginning of many Dalit students getting into uh, Hyderabad Central University. So you see uh, some sort of like people, you know, people facing ragging, people facing discrimination. And that also led uh, the students to form their own group to protect themselves. And so on one side, you have, uh, you know, a Dalit consciousness gradually rising in a place like Andhra Pradesh post Dalit massacre. You have a big political event like Mandal Commission, where students are divided across campuses. And then the ragging and discrimination that is happening in the campus, which led to the formation of um, the uh, Dalit student group. Mostly, to, mostly they were Dalits, Amitkar Student Association. Um, that's how it started. And, and around that point of time, JNU, there was a small group that started um, United Dalit Student Forum, but it could not last. It could not sustain. Very few people were part of it. They used to organize small, small night talks and events, but it could not last for long. So it just, you know, stayed as a very passive body for a very, very long time until 2011, 12, when they started organizing again, you know, the same thing, talks, academic talks and cultural events. Um, I think, uh, you know, the major reason again would be about resources, you know, about having a, a organizational structure, about having a certain ideology. Uh, when you talk about left student activism or we, when we talk about ABVP, there is a certain amount of training that comes with it. Uh, there's, a, there's a certain amount of training that, you know, there's a certain amount of grooming that happens from the, you know, the political party they are part of or they are affiliated to. However, these Dalit students who came to universities, for the first time, they were, start, they were starting to read subaltern histories. They were, starting to, they, they were starting to read Ambedkar. They were starting to read Fule. They were starting to read all of these icons. And um, so for them to grapple with so many questions, you know, when I talk about uh, Ambedkar student activism, uh, you also need to understand, um, like you also need to express yourself. What is, what is, Ambed, what is Ambedkarism? What is Ambedkar, what is Ambedkar discourse? And because uh, because uh, you know because Andhra Pradesh had a very strong Dalit movement, uh, you know there was a certain amount of consciousness, but JNU and DU did not have that kind of a consciousness uh, at that point of time. And uh, then around 2011, 12, uh, like I came to JNU in 2012, and there were few Dalit students who used to who started a magazine called who used to run a magazine called Dalit uh, Untouchable. The unt sorry, untouchable India, and they used to write small, small articles, and they used to discuss. You know, once when once in a while they used to sit together and discuss. However, when uh, campus politics, campus elections used to happen, they used to go and vote for left student parties, or they used to be uh, part of the left student groups in JNU. 
And in 2014, uh, students, uh, students from again, you know, again, I, the students from places where Dalit movement has been very, uh, you know, very vibrant, like Maharashtra, Uttar Pradesh, uh, Telangana, Andhra Pradesh, or Tamil Nadu. Students from these states, um, they somehow came together and they decided, uh, they decided to form a group called um, BAPSA, Bisa Medical Fully Student Association. And most of them were first generation learners, but they were, they were doing, you know, they were research scholars. So they had read some amount of um, Ambedkar's writings. They had read some amount of literature, you know, like the, when I was a very young boy then, I was just in my bachelor's back then, and I used to listen to them. Uh, they would talk about Gay Lombard. They would talk about Kancha Elaya. They would talk about Elena Jellert. They would talk about Brajranjan Mani. They would talk about, um, yeah, they would talk about G. Aloysius. Um, and these writings somehow kind of helped us uh, to form a framework in how we look at uh, Indian society, how we look at Indian campus space. And Ambedkar has written on various topics. Ambedkar has written on women, Ambedkar has written on conversion, Ambedkar, Ambedkar has written on nationalism, Ambedkar has written on uh, democracy, Ambedkar has written on caste, Ambedkar has written on labor, Ambedkar has written on partition, Ambedkar has written on Muslims, Ambedkar has written on how, um, Ambedkar has written also about the history of India, right? Like there are certain statements he make how the history of India um, at a point of time was a conflict between Buddhism and Brahminism. And uh, he's then, apart from his own writings, he also takes his own personal position of converting to Buddhism. He takes his own, he changes his positions at various times uh, from, you know, wanting separate electorate to be part of general electorate. Then at a point of time, he's forming independent labor party, then moving on to, uh, you know, Sheryl Kast Federation, then finally forming Republican Party of India. So he's dealing with, so in his personal life itself, there are a lot of changes. Right, apart from his writings. And uh, people were kind of trying to understand whether Ambedkar believes in state socialism or Ambedkar believes in communism or Ambedkar is anti-communist, you know. Uh, so, so for the first time, this churning was happening, at least in, and people would fight for, you know, the whole night. I mean, I was part of it. They, the students, they would fight for the whole night, um, you know, because different people take different positions. If a, if a Buddhist student is coming from Maharashtra, he would say Buddhism is the way. If you're not a Buddhist, you're not Ambedkar, right? right? And someone like me, who is a Dalit convert Christian, and I'm like, how do I be part of it? right? And someone is coming from uh, Tamil Nadu who, do, who does not believe in any religion. He's saying, I'm Ambedkar, right, but I also follow Periyar. You know, and I'm, so, I'm a rationalist. So these kind of debates used to keep happening. And, um, but despite all these debates, they decided to form an organization and... Um, uh, there was no contribution. There was no contribution from outside. Uh, they started pouring in their own money, uh, you know, from their, you know, from the net and JRF that the JRF they used to receive. And um, of course, like any other group, uh, they had to form an organizational structure, like of core committee, the executive members, general membership, and um, who would be who would be responsible for what duty and who to invite to give talks. Know, how to write uh, pamphlets because uh, in a space like JNU, uh, the you know the what they call debate and dissent, you have to write pamphlets, you have to share your ideas. So and you have to intellectually engage. And um, so they had to you know like any issue, any issue that is happening around the country, be it uh, you know um, be, be it uh, some caste atrocity, be it on reservation, uh, be it on the current regime. Uh, be it on women's question, be it on displacement, uh, be, be it on land grabbing, they had to they had to write article. And I think that uh, engagement over a period of time and uh, that, that engagement over a period of time, uh, you know, kind of created that intellectual base uh, for engaging, uh, for creating their own discourse. And I think that's what Babsa did at a point of time from 2015 to 2019. That's what Babsa did. Uh, while and even like there were, they were very critical questions like caste among Muslims, caste among Christians, and um, reservations among OBCs. Uh, you know whether there should be different categories, extremely backward caste, most backward castes, or they should only be OBCs. So there were many debates uh, that that kept happening within these groups, and which keep which still keeps happening, right? Which still keeps happening, and uh, I think. Uh, that's when Babsa took a, Babsa took Babsa uh, Babsa started uh, you know in terms of 
in terms of uh, starting ambedkar age student groups i think it was ambedkar student association which did it in hyderabad central university but in terms of intellectually engaging i think it was bisa ambedkar fully student association which started in gnu um uh, and but slowly there was some kind of support from fa- few faculty members a uh, few bureaucrats few dalit bureaucrats who would financially support few uh, faculty members who would kind of guide these students um and um, you know there there were difficulties there were problems but somehow the students um you know the organization kept going and like there are some very key questions that usually uh, students dominated with dalit and low caste groups engage with you know the question of reservation in campus the question of discrimination in campus or the question of safe space uh, to be able to express oneself you know to yeah so these are few questions reservation discrimination and to find a safe space and these are the kind of issues that babsa kind of started doing um, in campus uh, in in jnu and um, of course uh, symbolism you know the cultural politics also played a very important role and i think that's where um, being part of babsa Uh, that's where i placed myself at that point of time where for the first time in a campus like jnu uh, people would uh, they started um, they started using uh, blue flags you know blue flags blue flag symbolizes dalit movement these blue flag symbolizes dalit get movement so they started using blue flags or they started giving the slogans jai bhim uh, they started organizing cultural events uh, for the first time dalit students were in the forefront they was that they started to speak and i think i was part of that generation uh, you know around 2015 16 uh, and uh, and since i knew some amount of english you know like i could write in english i could handle social media uh, so um, you know to to kind of uh, popularize babsa uh, and I, i i was given that role of organizing cultural events and uh, spreading the writings you know creating visuals uh for uh, taking videos taking photos and uploading it on social media and i think 2016 played a very important role in terms of ambedkar student activism um post rohit ramula's death um before rohit ramula of course uh, uh like um, i i don't think anybody would have heard of ambedkar student activism like so you know like before rohit ramula's death but after rohit ramula's death i think that triggered a lot of young dalit students young low caste students um you know to express themselves that they also felt some sort of discrimination they also felt some sort of exclusion in campus space and they wanted to express it and that was also that point of time when digital media uh, was booming you know uh, you had all of these media platforms such as scroll quint news laundry news minute all of them were coming up so people were stu- young students were consuming a lot of information and uh, so student politics in general was no longer limited to uh, even jnu february 9th right that that was a huge moment for student activism in india and so young students were no longer limited to organizational student politics you know everybody felt the need to express themselves on social media everybody felt the need to be um part of some of the other group every every everyone felt the need um to express themselves and uh, they were consuming information from all different sides and so yes digital me- digital media boom and uh, rohit ramula's death in 2016 and jnu that event um, it provided for the ground uh, for uh, ambedkar student activism to emerge of course um um organize of course it helped organizational student politics like babsa or um, ambedkar student association to gain more visibility but apart from that it also gave a space to so many young students across the country uh, to articulate themselves uh, to articulate themselves and to um, you know start writing uh, on social media and so now you see a growing amount of uh, you know a growing amount of uh what do, what do you say pages you know on instagram on facebook uh people are creating content you know people are creating memes people are create young students are creating illustrations um and um you know it's it's a healthy of course at times it's uh, it's very difficult to keep up with it because there are a lot of information flooding in on the social media but at the same time i think young students are also uh, trying to navigate this space of ideology of this space of debates and discussion that are happening on social media to take sides and um, i think that's a very healthy thing to do mm. and 
uh, but uh, one more thing that ambedkar student activism uh, did uh, was that um, it also created um, apart from of course uh, you know writing and uh, write, writing about these issues um, one more thing that it did was uh, to ensure that caste was being discussed in campus spaces um, that's why today you see um, so many campus spaces you know from law universities to you know like arts and humanities colleges they organize talks on caste uh, to bring about awareness to bring about uh, to bring about a certain uh, certain sense of sensitivity inside campus space and, and i think that's the biggest contribution of um, ambedkar student activism today uh, where um, you know young dalit students uh, or students coming from marginalized groups get an opportunity uh, to speak to articulate themselves to be confident and um, not just in, on social media but even in campus space uh, it will take a long time but i think that's happening and um, yes i think that's it uh, from my side um, and i would really hope to have some questions uh, it will be really nice thank you sumit for this insightful lecture your activism and assertion has inspired all of us apart from this your performances with the french live radio paris have been a proud moment sumit was featured among the 15 youngsters to watch out for the decade by times of india currently he is pursuing his studies from university of oxford we thank you again for releasing the magazine we are now open to questions participants can post their questions on the chat box or they can post their names and we'll call out their names and they can unmute unmute themselves Kavya Yes ma'am Okay so we have que one question in the chat box from Samir Thomas he says uh, discourse on caste in the mainstream has often been dominated by questions of reservation do you think this can change or needs to change if so how uh yes uh, i think yes uh, discourse on mainstream media if you talk about caste uh, revolves around two uh, three three topics one is reservation one is caste violence and the other is vote bank politics right um so the way it's it, it it's presented is you know it it almost makes young dalit students to defend students coming from scs to obc backgrounds to you know it puts them in a defensive position as to why do you take reservation you have to defend it right and that debate keeps getting repeated in campus spaces that debates keep getting repeated on uh, mainstream media but on uh, beside that there is also another aspect to it that is caste violence every single time there is a uh, gruesome caste violence in some part of the country um, discussion happens at least nowadays you know post uh, if you can talk about hatras or saharanpur incident and then dalit um, dalit becomes a victimhood subject so everybody start pouring in sympathy everybody start pouring in oh you know it it, it was uh, that we should support these people something bad has happened and all of this it keeps that debate keeps happening or apart from that uh, when mainstream dalit political parties like bsp or vck um, they you know they 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 are being labeled as uh, doing vote bank politics so usually caste gets limited largely to these three issues and i think um uh, how it can be changed is of course through writings through discussions and uh, discussions in campus space through writings uh and of course getting more space at least in the debates of mainstream media about you know the amount of land that it's hold in this country you know amount the amount of resources different caste groups have uh amount of um you know access to water different groups of people have or you know i mean the discussions has have to be diversified in a way where caste can be spoken in ways of uh, holding land labor resources 
about migration and about housings and um, access to health facilities. I mean, it has to be diversified on different um, dif different spheres. Only then can you know we can only then we can go beyond the issue of reservation, which keeps getting repeated. And it will take a very long time, I guess. I actually wanted to ask him a question. So uh, I recently read that uh, the United Dalit Students Forum is not actually a political party that, uh, uh, for example, like um, contests elections in um, student campuses. Uh, so I feel like there is a lot of focus, as you said, when it comes to Ambedkarite parties, that these are parties that are only playing, quote unquote, vote bank politics. But when we look at parties like UDSF, and how they are not exactly related to electoral politics. I feel like um, these parties then uh, are breaking through that idea that, you know, Ambedkarite parties are only here for electoral politics. So in your opinion, what is the importance of such parties, which are more often than not acting like support groups, for, for instance? Yeah. Yes. I think I'll begin with uh, something very interesting. When, when I was in JNU, I remember uh, there was this guy called Jitendra Manji. Uh, the chief minister of Bihar was invited for the first time. And in a place like JNU, where you have uh, Brinda Karat, Sasi Tharoor, and uh, people like Kavita Krishnan coming and giving speeches in flawless English, at that point of time, uh, Babsa had invited um, Jitin Ramanji. You know, he comes from the Musaha community to speak about experiences of being a Dalit chief minister. And many people label that as uh, emotional Dalit. You know, so they were like, uh, so the discussion in the campus was, oh, Usually, the students who do Ambedkarite student activism, they're very emotional. So there is no intellectual aspect to their lives. You know, they just share lived, lived experiences. I think that debate has been very much there. Even people like Gopal Guru talk about it, right? About lived experiences and uh, theoretical Brahmins and empirical Sudra sort of a debate he, kind, he tries to bring in. Um, yes, that, um, I think that's also, uh, like you said, um, it, it needs to be broken again, you know, and that's why I always find it very difficult to be in a place to talk about lived experiences because lived experiences can give you a certain idea of what a certain part of society is going through, what they're facing, but at the same time, it can also reduce you as a victimhood subject, right, where you don't intellectually engage. And that's why I think Ambedkar could never be reduced to a certain emotional subject, apart from waiting for a visa where he's writing about his personal experiences in few chapters. I don't think anywhere else throughout his intellectual engagement, he writes about his personal experiences. He's always giving a certain objective analysis to various things. And I think that needs to be broken. And um, UDSF from the very beginning did that. From the very beginning, UDSF uh, kept doing... Um, uh, kept organizing talks, kept organizing talks from 1995-96, they've been doing it. And I think Babsa also tried to take that on after a point of time. Even ASA, you know, they consistently, they do that. And uh, especially in the recent times, um, there's been a lot of focus, at least post Rohit's death. I think many people keep telling, uh, many senior would keep telling that, you know, you shouldn't just drift away in the stream of activism so much that you lose yourself you know you have to be educated you have to be intellectually informed is something that is being totally you know something that has been constantly emphasized upon but yeah you know but like lastly i would say that i don't differentiate um uh, this you know i don't create this binary of uh, emotional you know an emotional dalit and intellectual dalit i don't think that exists you know they you know i don't think one should look at it in that way um it has its own relevance in different times, you know, in different contexts, I guess. Thank you. Okay, so next question is by Jesse Imam, our teacher coordinator. So is the force of anti caste public is the force of anti caste public sphere in social media an outcome of lack of access in public institutions? Um I think to, to a certain extent, yes. Um, in camp, I mean, if you talk about organized student politics, except Hyderabad Central University or Osmania, Osmania or uh, places like JNU, where BAPSA and ASA and other organizations like Delhi Student Union, uh, who get a space. I mean, because of these student organizations, young Dalit Bhojan students also get some kind of space within academia. You know. 
I mean, the student, the camp, the professors. Uh, the departments also are suppose uh, they are also bound to negotiate. You know, give some space because it's with they are very active. You know, they are demanding something. Uh, but I think at other colleges and campus spaces, if you look at it, even if uh, young students from marginal sections form different anti caste groups, small small groups, it gets reduced to reading circles at times, or it gets reduced to you know some sort of. Uh, some sort of memory, you know, creating memory like every year Rohit Ramula dies. So January 17th, we have to organize some small thing or Ambedkar, April 14th, uh, it's Ambedkar's birth anniversary. So we have to organize something. So it gets reduced to that. And um, that's where, you know, societies, you know, different societies, you have debating societies, you have drama societies, different societies and extracurricular groups. They take up all of that space. And those are fun and entertaining and uh, students coming from, you know, dominant sections they have that aura, you know, body politics, you know, they have that presence to attract, you know, groups of people. They have that presence to create something very interesting. And in that, I think students coming from marginalized sections, trying to create an anti-caste kind of space, you know, it, even though they might have that articulation, even though they might have that understanding, somehow it gets, you know, faded away. Somehow it gets faded away. And also the other reason is that many of them deal with a lot of family issues, like they have to take care of their family. They have to also focus on academics because for the first time they're coming into university and college space where they have to have readings, you know, new kind of, uh, you know, they have to present papers. So all of these are very new things that are happening for them. And to be confident among, uh, you know, let's say students coming from Jadapur University, a presidency, or like let's say St. Joseph's College, Bangalore, or St. Xavier's Bombay, to be part of them and to create your own space and to stand up, I think it takes a lot of courage. And I think that's where social media, you know, it's an anonymous space. You're sitting behind and you're just expressing yourself. I think that's how, I mean, I would look at it that way, where you don't have to face anybody. You can just write, you express yourself, and then you can just go into silence. Nobody's, you know, people will debate, but you can just sit there. And, and also there's a lot of support groups. Like, um, so if if something happens to me, if I'm writing something, uh, I'll give you a recent example. I was debating someone on the question of conversion recently um, on Dalits conversing to Christianity and the impacts of it, the repercussions of it. I was debating someone and many people started trolling. Many people started giving hostile comments. But as soon as the hostile comments started, so many young Dalit Christians from different part of the country who are part of anti christian activism, they started pouring in. They're saying, so it wanted to be part of it. No, you won't let you be trolled just like that. I think, yes, you know, social media gives that, uh, you know, anonymity. And it, uh, it it provides you with that space, which I don't think campus space has given. At least, um, I mean, living JNU and HU, I'm saying, and Osmania. In JNU, you, you can openly do anti caste activism today, or even in HU, but not in other college spaces. Thank you. Uh, the next question is from Damni. Uh, she asks, uh, Sumit, thank you so much for this lecture. I have learned a lot from you all throughout. I want to ask what are the advice you would give, uh, you would like to give to students from Dalit communities studying universities in the socio-political period since the battle needs to be fought at multiple levels? Uh, well, I can, I can tell you from my personal experience, like when I started doing activism in JNU, um, one thing was very, one thing that was clearly told to me from um, the seniors, at least from in Babsa or Ambedkar Student Association from um, Hyderabad Central University, that you never compromise with your studies. You never compromise with your studies. Your academics is going good, then come and be part of activism. Otherwise, what happens usually with many left student groups is, you know, there is, uh, there is, uh, you know, usually there's no space of that space of caring for whether your academics is going good, whether your family is doing well, you know, you're part of, you're, you're certain proletariat, okay, you're going there, you're for the revolution. Your life is for it. Uh, but I don't think Ambedkar student parties, they do that kind of a politics. Mm. Usually there is a certain, you know, usually there is a certain stand of pragmatism, like you have to take care of your studies. That's for sure. And um, make sure you, uh, your academics is going good. Um, but at the same time, be informed by your own self. You don't have to, um, you know, you, you, do, you don't have to be worried 
about you know when you look at all these big big articles people are writing conferences seminars happening all around you don't be get you know you, you don't get consumed by it you start reading on your own i did my basic readings i used to go to bookstores i used to st- start reading from small small leaflets like this this there's a group called critical quest which jealous just started so he would publish a small small articles from antonio gramsci from marx uh, from ambedkar from fule periyar and uh, i read that i started reading kancha ilaya i started reading g alusius i started reading elena zeller so you keep getting informed by yourself and of course in social media people keep putting different uh, sources people keep writing keep an eye on it be politically informed so that uh, when you're in a space uh, you're not under confident yeah you're not under confident because confidence is one thing that that really hampers a lot of students coming from marginalized sections but take your own time be informed uh, be informed try to look out and also finally i would say um, be in touch with few students you know it need not be students coming from marginalized groups but like minded students who care for you um, who can understand you and so that you know in terms in times of difficulties both in academics but also in your personal life you can reach out to them because i don't think everywhere you have student groups like babsa or asa to reach out to thank you so next question is from shreya she asks in today's political climate college campuses are being increasingly depoliticized and action is taken against students engaging in any form of activism in these times how do students organize and engage in politics i think uh, well it's, it's a very difficult question to answer because um uh i mean the way uh, st- like students ha- at least in the last two years post anti ca protests um like you see a lot of students getting arrested and put behind the bars um but yes i think um i mean f- my my way of doing things would be uh, to always preserve yourself for the long term i mean that's how i would do it if there are risks if that if there is a space to do a certain kind of activism uh, you do it but um, i mean especially if you're coming from marginalized groups because when you when you're charged with something when you're charged with something when you're you know targeted by something by the by any group beat the current political you know beat the ruling regime or beat any other group nobody will be standing with you at that point of time and that's a very difficult thing and that i have learned from uh, rohit ramula movement after rohit ramula movement many students if many rohit ramula's friends friends of rohit ramula today they in a very difficult place the same students who started a country wide agitation you know at a point of time they are now they are looking for jobs to sustain themselves you know they they are struggling there is nobody with them and uh, no lawyers will come to you no legal support you know i don't think the dalit community itself is so strongly organized at least in legal front to come and support you um so yes i mean the best part would be um, to silently uh, build up things you do not need to be critical all the times to build up slowly i mean you help students you help your own students somehow to give them advices or make sure that they reach university somehow i mean preserving all the way not completely stopping activism but preserving uh, preserving yourself and uh, be being pragmatic i guess i mean not unnecessarily getting into polemics on social media that cannot you know that will end up in trouble somehow i mean of course despite not creating troubles people get into people are being charged i'm not denying that but i'm saying to be on the safer side Okay, so next, thank you. So next question is by Jessie Ma. It is, can emotional public be divorced from rational public? Why is that feminist emotional public is not looked on for being emotional public? Can you ask that again? Yeah. So can emotional public be divorced from rational public? Why is that feminist emotional public? 
is looked down for being emotional public. Okay, that's it. Yeah. Well, that's a, that's a very difficult question. Um, yes, I, I've thought about it. I've thought about this uh, for quite some time now. Um, and, I, and I think I'd like to give you an example of, um, I mean, I don't, I don't know how to differentiate between rational public and emotional public. Um, like, there are two ways I would like to talk about it, right? I would be looking at a speech of, um, like every time I look at speeches of Modi, or Yogi, and I'm being very, you know, the political, like I'm very clear on this. Every time I look at a speech of Yogi or Modi talking to the crowd, or telling the crowd something, uh, like let's say Modi is going to uh, Banaras and saying, um, I'm not here on my own, it's the Ganga Ma which called me. You know, it's the Ganga Maya who called me. Or Modi is going to uh, Assam and he's talking about who would know about tea better than me. Right? These are emotional appeals. Right? And he's capturing the masses. And there is, I mean, of course that charisma can be negative, but there is a certain amount of charisma which kind of captures that public. Right? And here he is invoking a certain amount of mother. Like, I'm not saying Modi is feminist or something. I'm saying Modi is evoking the image of mother. You know, he's going to his mother, he's bowing down, and there's a picture, you know, and that kind of is kept, you know, that, that kind of capturing the masses, right? On the other hand, um, I have seen people like Sashi Tharoor going and giving speeches in, you know, Oxford debating society or even in JNU with very, you know, like high intellectual like arguments, if one would say that. And if you put Sashi Tharoor out there talking to the public, I don't think people would be willing to listen to him. And I'm not saying Sashi Tharoor is rational or intellectual, but I'm saying a certain amount of intellectual arguments, nobody will be willing to listen to it. I think the um, the way our public is shaped, I think uh, very few people associate, um, I mean, relate to the public on their own plane. I mean, very few political leaders, uh, you know, speak with the public in their own language. Speak, speak with the public in their own language. And as of now, I think Indian society is very masculine. I mean, very masculine that a certain dominant politician, you know, taking control over things is always being looked up to. And that consciousness is, you know, usually created through mass media, through cinema. You know, you, you look at, um, you know, you look at movies, you'd usually find uh, if, if there is, a, if there is, every time there is a women politician, you know, like Rajniti, for example, you know, Katrina kept going into, uh, Katrina kept starting politics or Sonia Gandhi, if you look at that example, th there is always a certain amount of sympathy associated because her husbands have, her husbands are, you know, her, they don't have their husbands anymore, you know, so a certain amount of widow, there's a certain amount of sympathy and victimhood, that kind of image is created and that also creates emotional appeal. But on their own, I don't think with that kind of image, people would accept them or people would vote for them at that point of time. They have to invoke uh, some tragedy. Indira Gandhi has to invoke, Rajiv Gandhi, sorry, Indira Gandhi has to invoke some tragedy. Sonia Gandhi has to invoke some tragedy. Or else you become someone like Mamta Banerjee or Mayavati who are very angry, who are dominant, who take control of things. And um, it does not sit well with the public, usually, because they find it difficult to accept women taking control, I think. Yeah. And, but again, you know, I think, I don't know how I answered that, um, but like, I'll give you an example. Um, one event that happened in JNU, and this was a fight between Babsa and ABVP at one point. And um, there was a, uh, there was a protest, there was a protest in JNU and Babsa was protesting and I think ABVP came in. And I saw many, a few Babsa men were so angry, they wanted to go and fight physically. You know, like in the, in the class. And, it, and around that point of time, young Dalit women, uh, they came in between and they, they stopped that. And that night, I remember um, there was there was around six hours of conversations in that night. And these girls, like some of them were senior ones, they, they kind of invoked uh, how a village, you know, in village, when fight happens, um, how Dalit men are beaten up and there's nobody finally there. And 
uh, you know, there's a, it's a loss for the family, it's a loss for the community, and they try to invoke that. And they try to say that, you know, you cannot deal that with some amount of masculinity. You have to step back. You have to deal with some rationality at this point of time. But at the same time, there are also this the same Dalit women who would go and, you know, um, go and uh, fight when needed. Like, for example, they would go and uh, blacken the, you know, that um, statue of Manu in Rajasthan. Two women from Maharashtra went and did it, right? So I think there's, um, I think there's a lot to learn, especially from Dalit women activists. I think how to use emotions and how to make rational choices. <laughs> I think... Um, I mean, I don't know about other public activism, other kind of activism, but at least within anti caste activism, that needs to be done, I guess. Yeah. And I think the Babsa ADP example was just one of them. Thank you. Uh, there's another question from uh, Madhav. He says, uh, hello, Sumit. Do you think there has been enough engagement on Dr. Ambedkar's economic thought? A lot of people for their own ends have started co-opting Baba Sahib as some sort of pro-capitalism figure and socialist thought of anti-caste leaders hasn't been given its due. Um, yes, I, I think so because, yes, I definitely think so. Um, I mean, um, post, post Ambedkar, there have been three, uh, there have been two different strands of politics. One was agitational politics and one was electoral politics. Politics. When I say agitational politics, Dalit Panthers movement. Uh, of course, Bhim Army is also like that. You know, Bhim Army also reflects a certain stance of that uh, certain um, how do you call it? Certain militant politics, right? If there is atrocities, you go and be present there, like what Chandrasekhar Azad and groups do. If there is atrocities, we have to go there. You have to fight violence, sort of a thing, directly. And the other is what BSP does. We don't have to engage in this kind of agitations. It's a lot of loss for the community. So we kind of get political power. And then through political power, we try to change things. And even academics or even student and, and especially student activism, they deal with reservation again, you know, reservation and discrimination, two topics. They keep dealing with that. Um, even though there are people, there are scholars within the Dalit community who have engaged with economic thought, of Ambedkar, uh, the land holdings, um, nationalization, you know, which Ambedkar talked about. Um, people like Sukhdev Thorat or people like Narendra Jadav. I mean, there are two, three economists that I know of. Um, but again, again, on this economics front, I don't think much discussion has happened. And I, I never think Ambedkar was pro-capitalist, pro-capitalism. I think Ambedkar was for nationalization of things, nationalization of agriculture, nationalization of ba banks. I think so. I don't see that way, but I think the discussion needs to happen more often. And I think young students from campus spaces need to start doing it. Yeah. And again, you know, like um, there's also, and, and this is my critique for a certain middle class among Dalit and low caste groups. Um, after a point of time, uh, the emotional politics, you know, takes the emotional politics, the symbolic politics takes, uh, the you know it, it takes the center, center stage like every year april 4 10 we celebrate so we are correct you know so that sort of a thing and it needs to go beyond that thank you next question is from Renny thomas he says hi Simit. thanks for this excellent talk i was wondering if you can talk about the international solidarity especially after the black lives matter movement of course, of course, even before that as well. For example, the brilliant work that Suraj Yengre is doing with Cornell West and others in the US. Thank you very much. Uh, well, I think it's, it's a very interesting question. I written an article on this, on you know comparing Black Lives Matter with Dalit Lives Matter. Uh, and I had critiqued Suraj Yengre for this. I, I think we had a, a debate around that point of time. Um, uh, and it, it comes from my own understanding of Indian society, as well as what Ambedkar had written at a point of time. I think that solidarity goes back to Fule's Gulam Giri, where Fule is writing, uh, you know, Fule is dedicating his book to the, at that point of time, of course, the word that was used was Negro. So he's, you know, uh, dedicating that book to the Afro-Americans in the US. 
Uh, then of course Ambedkar is writing um, Ambedkar's engagement with uh, the Black movement is he's writing a letter to W. Du Bois, you know, uh, so just to know uh, how to get in, you know, how to. Um, I mean, there there are two letters exchanged between Ambedkar and W. Du Bois, where um, he just wants to know how to approach the United Nations on the question of untouchables. That's all I think. But apart from that, Ambedkar also brings about something very interesting. He talks about cultural and regional unity you know he, he talks about a certain cultural regional unity where he's saying that um in terms of uh, ethnicity how would a chamar from uttar pradesh be similar to a uh, paraya from um tamil nadu that's it or um, or uh, you know or a brahmin from punjab being similar to a brahmin from tamil nadu for that matter, right and but yeah moving on from that my only question my the my only point of difference like of course solidarity should be it should happen and uh, i think the dalit, dalit uh, movement can take a lot of inspiration the way in terms of organizing themselves how black lives matter does in terms of organizing themselves how they come together at one point of time but that also that also has a definite point of history it is you have to have a common history and my point of critique to suraj at that point of time was the term dalit itself emerged post 1970s you know after the dalit panthers movement and it kind of gained its ground in few states uttar pradesh maharashtra andhra telangana and tamil nadu were few castes in andhra you see mala and madiga in maharashtra you see mahars in uttar pradesh and punjab to some extent uh, the chamars they started accepting this word of dalit and they wanted to be part of dalit not just dalit political movement but uh, the dalit cultural consciousness to writings you know a lot of writings dalit writings comes from telangana and maharashtra uttar pradesh did not have that amount of you know that kind of a cultural movement right and and to organize i mean there are uh, there are only few issues that can that can bring dalits together in this country okay one is reservation okay and the other is everything that is related to state every single time the state intervenes in terms of let's say scst protection of scst prevention of atrocities act then of course dalit should come together on the streets they together at that point of time because it's a law that affects all of them right or let's say reservation is being you know uh, cut reservation is being tampered so they'll come to the street together but on on the other front i think in terms of violence in terms of demanding something uh, from the immediate surroundings i don't think they can come together as a whole right uh, because they are not one uh, i think the major reason for that is like especially when i talk about violence in tamil nadu the violence perpetrated on dalits is by one year stevers and gonders usually right in maharashtra there is another caste group that inflicts violence on you in uttar pradesh if in uttar pradesh if it, if it is thakurs who are dom- who are inflict Thing violence on you, then in Maharashtra it is Mara- Marathas, and in Tamil Nadu it is Vanyas, Tevars, and Gonders. So each has each caste group have their own battle to fight there, and also they are regionally geographically scattered. If the Parayas come from a certain part of Tamil Nadu, then the Pallars are coming from certain part of Tamil Nadu, right? If Valmikis are located, let's say Valmikis, Valmikis. in hatras if you see valmiki is where very very few families were there and many of these valmiki is they are located in urban cities whereas chamars are mostly part of rural background i mean they 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 form majority of the rural population so these geographical differences and different caste groups so i don't think uh, don't think dalits of tamil nadu will come to fight against uh, uh, the thakurs of up or the valmikis of delhi uh, will not come to go, not go and fight against the thakurs of up i think they have their own battle to fight so that's why i had my differences with suraj about having a you know overarching dalit lives matter movement when it comes to violence because each region each geography each you know the small small caste groups have to form their own support support system and then fight is that so i believe I mean that's how I would look at it. Thank you, uh, Jesse, ma'am. You wanted to ask a question. 
Yeah, uh, thanks, Sumit. It was a very engaging discussion. I have a follow-up question. Uh, considering the similarities between caste apartheid and apartheid based on race, wouldn't it uh, kind of give a certain kind of um, international exposure uh, to to link caste and race? Uh, maybe the hidden apartheid can be brought out. Um, yes, yes, definitely, definitely, that can be done. Um, I think I was part of this. I was in. I, I never knew about this. Um, I think 2018. I was. I was invited to um, this uh, World Christian um, World. Yeah, I was part of a talk in Geneva, and they kept telling me that you can be part of a discussion on caste, but through the lens of race. And I would never understand that. Uh, but later, when I spoke to many of the senior Dalit activists, Ambedkar activists, they told me that yes, you know, caste. For to bring up caste in a global platform, it's very difficult. So you have to somehow link it with race, and you have to make them understand somehow. Yes, I think that can be done to have international exposure, and like you know, one Rihanna's tweet could you know give exposure to farmers' movement. I think if um, if people like Cornel West, you know, if people like Cornel West and many other black scholars and you know Black Lives Matter movement, I think if they would talk about caste, if they would engage on caste. I think uh, exposure can be. I think exposure can be given. I, I think not just Dalits. I think um, even young students and research scholars from different backgrounds who come, who go and study abroad, you know, who are conscious of anti-caste movement, who are conscious of Indian society, they can play a huge role in you know in kind of exposing anti-caste movement abroad in whatever platforms that they get. I think they can do that. Um, I think they they should be the one doing it. Otherwise, I I don't think the Indian media will give you enough space. I mean, except I I I only see Caravan or the Telegraph, you know, taking that bold stance once in a while. But I don't think other media platforms will go beyond. You know, again, someone had asked a question beyond reservation. You know, um, because it also like I think it also uh, brings a certain amount of shame. I think. Like now, like the, in, in, there's always this uh, tendency to pro protect one's image, I guess. So even during COVID, uh, I could see a lot of tweets and uh, this thing from abroad, you know, from US. There were a lot of NRIs who were writing saying that, oh, the visuals of the cremation grounds, you know, they are bringing shame. You know, they shouldn't be publicized. Uh, it's a very sacred space. It shouldn't be publicized and all. So there's always this protection of image consciousness that is among Indians. And caste is caste is their you know caste is at the core of it. It's their family, it's their life, it's the community, it's marriage, uh, a lot of things. So they would always want to protect. I think young students who are studying abroad can do this far better than we sitting and doing it in India on Facebook and Instagram. You know, just writing few things. Thank you. Sameer Chaturvedi wants to ask some questions. Sameer, you can unmute yourself. Hello. Yes. Am I audible? Yes, yes. Yes. Hi, Sumit. Sorry, I joined a bit late, but uh, I want to engage with you on this question, like, see, uh, I am, I am also doing my, like, I have conducted research utilizing emancipatory methodology with uh, uh, disabled, fellow disabled. I am myself person with cerebral palsy. So you know what happened uh, once, uh, and. It was very critical observation as per my understanding goes. And then my research participant told me everything uh, about her and, and she also shared uh, stories of discrimination uh, which she faced uh, both uh, within her private spaces as well as professional spaces such, such as uh, college and everything. Okay. 
but uh, boy, like but later once i called her uh, to fix another meeting okay uh, and then she told me hey samir i am about to visit a beauty parlor with my friends so i said okay fine and uh, what about our meeting i want to meet you she did not uh, give me uh, another uh, like she did not give me any further appointments and which is fine uh, then i was just thinking like uh, when a research participant meets a researcher how she goes about constructing a research okay like she was telling me everything about her uh from a very probably she was hoping that i would be the voice and which i was willing to since i was employing emancipatory methodology uh, like she was she might have thought about me that if he writes about discrimination and everything it would be uh perfect for us marginalized disabled marginalized which was perfectly fine but then there was this other side when she was visiting this beauty parlor so how employing a research methodology can only provide us a partial picture of reality that human being goes through that was a critical point which uh, i am again and again made to reflect by that particular interaction which i had with uh, my participant so yes uh, yeah that 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 is it i think uh, i yeah, it's it's a difficult question to answer but i'll try um well um i think the um, the two is in how i look at it uh, one is um of course uh, every single time uh, not just students or research scholars going and doing research in a place or conducting ethnography in a place but apart from that even when ngos go or even us you know even when this supports you know even that kind of support groups just a second am i audible yeah yeah, yeah. yes 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 okay yeah so what i'm trying to say is um especially when people go to research people go into research right and not just students not just research scholars even ngos and other groups when they go and try to conduct some field study or something like that there's always this expectation from marginalized sections uh, that they would uh, they would receive something they would receive some sort of help right uh um, because of course on one hand uh, they are tired of the loop you know the way the governance happens in this country where you know even for a small small things you have to fight in the office you have to go and wait in front of the office and um, it's starting from small village i mean if you go, if you have to go and get something done in a panchayat office or if you have to go and um do get something done in the block development office there's always this wait there's always this you know people take it for granted and when somebody is coming to you you know some groups are coming to you to do some research they always they don't understand that uh, idea you know they don't understand what research you're doing you know what purpose it is going to serve but they have some hope that this is going to you know bring them out of something right? that's always there um but there are also people who get disappointed you know they don't want their their private lives uh, to be spoken about you know to be exposed to the outside i think and that's the dilemma you know two different groups of people you know they respond to research researchers and ngos in two different ways some would like to be very open about it and some try to just enclose themselves but other things i uh, one more thing that i would like to talk about here is how do you understand even research right the different facets of life that people have and this includes marginal sections um and i keep telling that uh, to i keep i keep sharing this every everywhere i go you know, even the most uh, politically articulate you know economically mobile talents or marginal sections do not be living a life of assertion the whole day in the 
right? Uh, the same way, a marginalized sections, a marginalized section, you know, a people coming from marginalized section living in slums and small villages, even they would not be living a life of victimhood day in day out, right? At that point of time, that person would have given, shared some sad stories to you, or spoken about his or her life. But immediately after that, that person is going to beauty parlor. So this is how life works. I mean, with with amidst all the difficulties, amidst all the problems, people try to find some kind of relief, some kind of respite. And I think going to beauty parlor or watching a movie or listening to a song or just being happy, I think that's how life is. And um, so, I mean, that's how multidimensional life is. It's not just one way of looking at it. Even during pandemic, yeah. even during pandemic, it's not like um, um, from 24 hours, people are going through experiencing that grief hmm. or experiencing that difficulties. I think amidst all of that, people try to find their ways out. That is what, so like I felt by employing a set of methodology, we researcher also limit uh, ourselves in uh, in our pursuit of understanding a compli complex uh, thing called life. Yes. Hello. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah, can I can I ask my question now? Yeah, yeah. Yes, Go yes. ahead. Okay, perfect. Uh, so uh, currently, I've been studying the Dravidian movement in detail, and I've noticed that the major difference between the politics, anti caste politics in South and in North is that South has a proper cultural movement, right? Except uh, in the North, we haven't had much of cultural movements with regards to anti caste activism. It hasn't permeated into, say, mass culture. It hasn't permeated into literary spheres uh, in any form. How do you think we can have that sort of thing in the North also? Yeah, I think you're right. When you say that, um, when you say that, you know, cultural movement is a huge role when it comes to Gabrielian politics, and it's not the same. I think it, one has to look at the history of anti caste movement, at least in North. Um, Yes, there has been cultural movement, but it's a long time back. When you say Sant Ravidas, you know, when you say people like Ravidas, people like Kabir, um, that history is there, but you know, it's, um, but after a point of time, it's also been co-opted. It's, it's being co-opted with the larger, you know, Hindu, you know, uh, Brahminical Hindu culture. It's, it's co-opted after a point of time. Um, but in, in, the, in the South, I guess it, it didn't happen that way in the South. Uh, the linguistic politics also played a very important role. Regional politics, it's not just cultural movement. You know, there is a certain idea of um, a certain cultural and regional separation, you know, exclusivity that happens with, you know, there's this Dravidian politics comes with linguistic dimension and also regional dimension that we are different from the North. You know, we are different from the North in terms of our language, in terms of our culture, and it's very different. You cannot just come and co-opt it. That's why RSS and many Hindu groups find it difficult to penetrate into uh, South, even in terms of electoral politics. Today, if you look at it that way, right? I think one major way to do it, I think, again, like I talk about history, BSP emerged, what was the slogan of BSP? That, uh, you know, getting political power, like, I mean, this is the key. Political power is the key. And when Kansiram and others were doing, um, they're going from village to village in terms of creating awareness, they were saying, Ek vote, ek note. So it's all about vote. You know, so through political power, we will create changes. Uh, after getting political power, we'll bring some schemes. You know, we'll develop the villages. We'll give you land, patas, and all of that thing they started doing. And I think uh, cultural politics plays a very important role. And I think Maharashtra is a very good example in that. Right? Because of that consciousness, um, Political power, Siv Sena might come to power, Congress might come to power, and in Maharashtra, the Dalit population is very less. And among that, the Mahars, who you know, who are kind of you know, in the forefront of Ambedkar politics, they're in very small numbers in terms of uh, their numerical influence in electoral politics, right? But even then, because of that consciousness, um, you know, because of that consciousness, because of that literary movement that has happened in Maharashtra in terms of symbolism, in terms of um, Buddha Viharas, in terms of the cultural consciousness that has happened in Maharashtra, 
I think it's very difficult to penetrate that. It's very difficult to change that again. Right? Change that. Go back to that same uh, Brahminical Hindu culture again. I think uh, that has to happen through writings. Through, you know, local uh, region. You know, it has to also, um, you know, cater to the local sensitivities. Like, let's say, if, if Bhojpuri is the language, in Bundelkhand, let's say, there is a certain language that people understand. You know, let's say, Fulan Devi is the icon in Bundelkhand region. So you have to inspire the masses through the imagery of Fulan Devi, through songs, through street theatres, through plays, uh, all of that. I think only that way they can relate to it. You cannot bring Periyar suddenly to, uh, you know, a, you know, a Chamar person in Bundelkhand and tell them that, look, that is anti-caste politics. I don't think that's going to happen. You know, it's same way. Uh, one has to understand regional and cultural sensi sensibilities, I guess. In my place, I come from South Orissa. Majority of us Dalits are Christians. You now we have converted. So for us, from a young age, we listen to like English music. We listen to like hill songs. We listen to gospel music because of the you know German missionaries that have come here, worked for all these years. So here, I don't think you can suddenly bring Buddhism and you can do some kind of cultural politics. It has to be through some other way. You, you have to organize some concert in my place to cater to the youths, to cater to the masses here. Right? So I think it's a lot to do with cultural and regional sensitivity. And that has to happen from within Uttar Pradesh or let's say Haryana or wherever. And again, at times I'm saying, um, when I say culture, again, I'm not saying the culture of the marginalized sections, the culture that they hold on to is always good. Because I always see a certain masculine chauvinistic tendency in places like Uttar Pradesh in Haryana, even among marginalized sections. And that also needs to be altered. There has to be voices from within who dissent, saying that this kind of culture is wrong. Like West West UP politics, you know, um, the, you know, it's gangster politics. <laughs> it's gangster politics. You have to have guns and revolvers, and you have to have these open jeeps. That's how you do politics. But after a point of time, that also has to change. Of course, you have to kind of counter the dominant Thakur politics, in, you know, in that place. So you have to kind of assert, but after a point of time, that masculine chauvinist tendencies has to change. And it, and, it, and it has to give space to different groups of people. Thank you. We have one last question from YouTube. Uh, this is a question by Rupa. Sorry, yeah. this is a question by Rupsa Nag. She asks um, about the pandemic. Many are now saying how Indian healthcare is collapsing when it's a fact that it has always been inaccessible. Could you therein elaborate on the issue of health access and caste, especially when sanitation and crematorium workers are in the front lines and are most affected, uh, exposed, and yet least protected? Uh, yes, yes, definitely. Uh, I think. Um very uh, very few people talk about it, especially when people were talking about frontline health workers, frontline health uh, frontline warriors. They were saying they 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 would refer to uh, you know doctors, then of course nurses, then some health workers who are working in the hospitals, but hardly sanitation workers or people who are working in the crematorium. And and I come from I come from the dome community, so I mean regardless of pandemic before pandemic or you know after pandemic or during this pandemic times i think um, there's always been this idea of um, i think it's this people take it for granted that these are the people who are supposed to do it these are people who are supposed to do it uh, and it's their caste ritual duty it's it's ritual duty so it's never looked at as some form of labor that people are doing you know it's their duty they're supposed to do it so even during pandemic or even before pandemic, I think every time somebody dies or some, you know, some dirt, you know, something, um, even the municipality, municipality tractors, you know, they would take all the garbage and go and put it somewhere near a Valmiki colony. You, if you look at in Delhi or across the country, they would always do that. And I think that's, um, I think people who um, are part of policy making process, especially in health sectors, should take into account, you know, should take into account social geography, you know, of different groups. And, um, and I think mechanization is the way. 
you know, like mechanization is the way. And I think not just Dalits, I think different groups of different caste groups have to participate in it. Um, you know, only when, like, for example, I'll tell you, uh, there is something that it keeps coming to my mind. There have been so many partitions, so many migrations that has happened in this country, but no other groups have received that amount of, you know, um, security and rehabilitation like the Kashmiri Pandits. You know, whatever has happened to them is really bad. It shouldn't have happened. But the amount of rehabilitation, the amount of security, the amount of housing schemes they got, I don't think anybody else got. You know, so anytime you diversify anything, you know, like let's say um, upper caste start doing these jobs, the government will pay attention. <laughs> Otherwise, they won't. Right? Or else maybe civil society groups or NGOs or political parties have to take it up. You know, they have to they have to somehow put pressure in in the uh, with the people working in the health sectors to somehow change this. But this is very difficult. I think um, caste ritual duty will keep going this week. Thank you so much. Uh, I think we'll close the chat box to questions now. Uh, thank you so much for. Uh, coming to this event and for answering our questions, Sumit. Uh, we now invite uh, Sharmi Godalika, who is a third year student from Sociology Anos, uh, Honors, to recite her poem. Hi, everyone. Uh, I hope all of you are doing well. If not, I hope you recover soon. Uh, before beginning my poem, I would like to thank Sumit sir for this very thought provoking lecture. It really did make me reflect on the dynamics of caste in my own campus life. And uh, secondly, I would also like to thank my department for giving me this opportunity to recite my poem. I uh, submitted this poem for the magazine and the theme of the magazine uh, is uh, COVID and campus spaces. This poem is titled Hammock and it is about the alienation experienced by a student due to the absence of the safe space, the safe space being the campus. And being a third year student uh, this year, I got a got lot of questions from uh, you know distant relatives and friends whom with whom I haven't talked from many years about my career plans and what I want to do with my life and all these sort of questions. So this poem is about the emotions faced uh, by a student. Here I begin. My voice is like a cry inside a vacuum cleaner. I squeeze things and unwanted thoughts inside and make a clean house of deception. The lonely mirror of my house cries that nothing and no one can suit me. You say that an apple a day keeps the doctor away. I sip my apple juice, but it turns into vile poison. Did you have to add those spoonfuls of imposing expectations? I feel nauseated. I, I feel nauseated. I want to regurgitate, but I've already assimilated the pills. These pills of despair, that syrup of guilt, those tablets of pity, and this strip of disgust. I, I feel tangled in my emotions. I feel trapped in an asylum in my mind. But I want to wonder, but I want to wonder, unfettered and unhindered, can I please be discharged now? You ask why I feel these emotions. No, I don't want to share. I have morphed into the locked cupboard and I have lost the keys. And no, I absolutely don't want your advice on my future. I may wear those words, forget my shoes, and walk on broken glass. Yes. Maybe I'm lazy. Yes. Maybe I'm lazy. Okay, yes. Now stop shouting into my ears. They are bleeding now. Yes. I am lazy and unproductive. Yes. I'm lazy and unproductive. Yes, I'm lazy and unproductive. I'm lying on a hammock tied to the fangs of an unknown creature. Thank you, everyone. 
Um, thank you, Sharmi, for that lovely piece of poetry. Um, that was, I'm sure, an amazing contribution both to today, today's event as well as the Meraki magazine itself. Um, coming to talk about my experience as a final year student. Well, um, it all started with one Google Meet that involved all of us preparing to get a head start once college reopens. Talk about famous last words. The journey of putting this year's edition of Meraki has been a long one filled with uncertainty. Uncertainty about our ideas, our very perspectives and visions as Ed Board members as well as, as individuals. There were decisions that took months to be put in place, while others, like the very theme of Meraki 2020 to 21, were decided on a whim. We knew we wanted this enough to have last minute meetings where we wanted to pull our hair out because we kept getting disconnected. We knew we wanted this enough to push through the bad days of laziness. We knew we wanted this enough that we hounded anyone who could be of resource. We knew we wanted to create something as unique as, dare I say, the global pandemic itself. But we also knew we wanted to put something out there that every sociology student, every JM site, every individual really could relate to. It wasn't easy. There were days when we really had to ask ourselves, can we even do it? Well, today's the day that answers it because here we are. Taking right from where Ananya has left, as we've spent this last year working on this magazine, it's actually been one of the ways I felt connected to college. It's so easy to lose motivation, to lose touch with all that's going on. But this magazine has been a sort of reminder that we've made it, that I still have something to give to my college, my department. The piece I wrote was a very personal one about how we've all found our way through relationships while social distancing. And as the making of this magazine has also happened over multiple Google Meet calls and back-to-back -back WhatsApp messages, it's just a testament to how this magazine has also been on this social distancing journey with us. It's almost like a legacy and I know that the next year magazine will narrate completely different tales as the editorial board will also have different experiences. We just hope that this magazine always remains a safe space for your words. Thank you so much, Akshita and Ananya for sharing your experience with us. This edition of Miraki is a compilation of the stories and experiences of a large number of people who kindly gave us their time and patience. The wage workers of our campus spared a heavy portion of their valuable time to speak with us and helped us understand the version of reality and how drastically it changed with the virus. We also thank our teachers for their detailed perspective on the online education system and the struggles that came along with it. Our college freshers, whom we have never met offline, have been nothing but helpful in sharing their stories of college life as the first batch to start college and not be able to experience what we imagine to be the quintessential college culture. We were also fortunate enough to speak to several anti-caste activists and student leaders who gave us their rather insightful opinion on the shift in political space and the bearing online education has had on different sections of society with respect to gender and caste. A special thanks to Ria Arora for designing the front and back cover of the magazine and Annie Thomas and Rashi Shah for their beautiful illustrations. We also thank Sumit for taking out the time today and enlightening us. It made the release of the magazine all the more special. We would also like to extend our thanks to our principal, Dr. Sandra Joseph, and the teachers of the sociology department for their help and support in the making and release of this edition of the magazine. Finally, we would love to thank Dr. Jesse Philip and Dr. Renny Thomas for their never-ending support and for guiding us with a valuable input throughout the process of making this magazine. Last but not the least, we thank the audience for joining us today and for attending the lecture and supporting us in our magazine release. I would now kindly request everybody to please turn on their cameras if they can so that we can take a group photograph.